procurement league um this is super exciting for us because we're always looking to find the best minds from across the world in the space of procurement so to be able to get you is just really humbling for us so thank you so much um i'm going to quickly start by introducing you to my best understanding uh but then i'm going to let you introduce yourself so so rui like like what i understand of your last decade and a half in uh no almost 20 years in procurement is um you've been at borg stena for about 15 years 14 years uh before that you've done some other jobs at as a global strategic procurement manager logistics coordinator at johnsons uh you've been with ceramica rodeo for four years um and now you work with one alliance as a global sourcing sourcing manager um which which is just like a lot of time in some organizations and some little time in some places but um you you just like been heading and you've been the vice president uh, at one of the biggest uh, textile companies so so i'm just really excited we've never had anyone from the textile space in procurement come and be on this so just really looking forward to hearing all about your life and journey and wisdom but i'll let you introduce yourself and then we'll kick off uh, my name is roy oliveira thank you for for this invite uh, it's always a pleasure to to talk to colleagues of the procurement area and share uh, my thoughts and also hear the thoughts of my colleagues because together we are one together we learn with each other in in a very more um, growthful way um i started my professional career over 25 years ago as you said uh, in the ceramics industry uh, traditional industry and i left that industry and i went to the automotive field in the automotive field i uh, was at johnson controls but also in textile related products and then went to borgstein also in textile related products within my career um one of the focuses has always been procurement uh, i think that in life you, you need to find the right work life balance and in procurement is is an area that i have passion for that i like what i do um uh, i believe that procurement is uh, today even more important in the organizations i've had this vision for a long time it's a strategic function and and any company that has to have success, that wants to have success in the next years has to put procurement in the core of the operations. Um you have to have a cradle to cradle mindset where you have to look where you are installed and from the beginning to the end how you will be able to, to be able to have success on the long journey and not only on the short term. And the textile industry in itself it's it textile it, it's in the automotive textile field that I work mostly but as such textile is textile Uh, India is is a, a very interesting and strong hub uh, in the textile industry. I've been there many times, especially in Rajasthan, uh, visiting companies, visiting partners that that I've worked with in the past, and I continue also to cooperate currently. Uh, and in procurement in itself is is very dynamics. Um, I remember when I started in the industry. 14, 15 years ago, more directly involved in procurement in itself. there was a more there was installed a mentality of we have to be tough 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 and i've always had a mentality a bit different that i i believe in cooperations i believe that you have to have joint cooperations to have joint success uh, the pandemic th this year you have with pfizer and biontech where a cooperation between two companies not only led to to grow to a better world in terms of health but also a sustainable business where they both made money Okay. that's where you leverage your cooperations when when you put uh, the, the different partners not look at suppliers as just my supplier but look at it as a partner within the organization so i've always had this mentality that procurement needs to be at the center uh, of an organization if it wants to have success in the future um in my last company i spent almost 15 years in the company very long time um very nice company very nice people 
was able to contribute positively for the results and the strategy in the long term. It also gave me the vision um, of what is necessary to succeed in the world, uh, the necessary for a company to have uh, an organization, to have a, a systematic approach. Um, and there also uh, within the lean principles, we have to think lean, we have to think of uh, reducing waste, reducing um, all non-added value uh, areas. Uh, for example, in procurement, what, why do we want to, to focus a lot on digitalization? It's so all, all, all of the tasks that are systematic and not having to think or take decisions on should be automated. People should focus in, in added value uh, areas. So I, I did like working the company for 14, 15 years. I had a very good work-life balance, which is also important, but it comes a time in your career, in your life that uh, you, have, you want to do something different, you want to contribute differently. And by stepping out of that company, initiating the project in One Alliance, it was to do something different. Uh, we work with many different companies um, from business development to supply chain management. From the, we work from tier customers to OEMs in automotive and non-automotive field. We maintain a confidential the, the names of the companies, but it's, a, it's an area where we can contribute to different organizations. Uh, we're bringing different players from the textile industry into the automotive that were before fashion companies, um, giving opportunities to others. Uh, there is, if you think of sustainability and procurement, sustainability is making what you can with today's assets. And when you look in this in business environment and with the growth and expansion of, of the automotive industry, what you have seen is a lot of companies coming up and say, okay, I, I'm going to win this project. So I'm going to invest, make a new factory, make this, but they're already installed capacities. So if we don't think of the, the installed capacities, the assets that already exist, even though they're not under my own roof, we're not contributing in the long run for a more sustainable world. If our idea is to continuously invest in network and cooperation, then it, we're not going to lead to a very sustainable world where you're going to have the machines duplicated in various uh, locations and none of them are working at 100% level. Uh, you see today the OEMs leveraging this, incorporating amongst themselves and in the same factory, building different brands. Sorry, can I, can I interrupt you for a quick second and ask you a question before we get into the rest of the questions? So, so Rui, I, I, I am from Rajasthan. Uh, I haven't lived there in a really long. But Banswara. There, yeah, but um, no, from Jaipur. I've been there also in Udaipur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I was born in Jaipur and then I left. But, but just being, I mean, I've been away from India for, me for really long. But just when I look at India, when I look at Jaipur, when I look at Rajasthan, when I look at Baswara, when I look at Bikaner, Churu, I feel like Haryana, Noida, Punjab, I feel like the focus for them, especially the textile industry in India, isn't sustainability. Um, you know, it's, it's mass production, it is quick production, it is cheap production. Um, cheap selling, bargaining, hustling, all of that. So, so talk a little bit more about this aspect before we get into the formal part of the rest of the conversation. Right. When we talk about sustainability uh, in the different regions, you, you have that problem not only in India, you have it all over the world. The fashion market has moved forward with uh, fast consumption and fast fashion. I think that there needs to be, and there is a movement on that side to move away from fast fashion into more sustainable fashion. That's where the companies continue producing, be it in India, be it in uh, Europe, be it in Africa, be it wherever it is. They continue mass production because that's what the final customer wants. Any real change in sustainability has to come from the customer itself. The customer has, be, has to be willing to make changes on their own uh, thought mind, in their own process of buying and, and what they want to buy. You know, it, it comes from the customer. Because companies are made um, to make money. Companies are made to, for growth. Companies are made to contribute to society. I also know these companies in, in India. And at the same time, they continue with mass productions, India, China, not only. But they also have a lot of activities where they contribute to the community. 
they also work with the community for development um, in terms of raw materials in itself. There are some good projects in terms of the re recycled polyester globally, inclusive in India, that are more being incorporated because the final customer so wishes. So any change has to be also always customer oriented and there has to be a balance between economic, social uh, and environment. Got it. Okay, so, so let's maybe like some of these concepts will iron out for all of us as we get into uh, this conversation. But, but 14 years in a tech core textile company in the heart of Portugal, um, I'm, I'm sure your learning evolved a lot in those 14, 14 and more years. Uh, talk a little bit more about that. I'm, I'm really curious to hear your journey through the, that time. Well, within those 14 years, I worked with great colleagues, uh, great people that I learned a lot from, uh, from the shop floor to the CEO, uh, all people that I have learned with and grown with. Uh, within the 14 years that uh, the, the company was physically, the headquarters was in Portugal, but I spent uh, almost half of the year traveling outside. Okay, so uh, being in Portugal or being in uh, Korea or being in Japan or in China or in Brazil or in India, I'd be active anyways, because we already had the internet uh, where, where you're, you're placed and you're talking to people at the same time. So independent where it is, the, the, the company being located in Portugal had the benefit of having a very good work-life balance with quality of life. That uh, I, I have to say was added value. And at the same time in an industrial environment where I would travel, I would go to the other factories of the group, I would go to customers, I would go to new suppliers, I would look for sourcing opportunities in India, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, uh, in Vietnam. <laughs> and Europe. So it was always continual, continuously traveling, thinking the strategy, thinking long-term, okay, and, and what, what we, where we wanted to be in the next five, 10 years, and start working on that journey before doing that. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So tell me what, what changed in your 14 years of, you know, work? Like what, what changed about your outlook towards uh, the, the subject of sustainability, textile, procurement, your understanding of procurement? What changed over the 14 years that you were there about you and your principles and your thinking? Well, when we look at it, you start in a company first, you start on the basics in any company. What I think the change for the positive is more of a strategical mindset of placing procurement at the core of the business, um, looking at the different concepts, uh, continue with the evolution. When we look at sustainability and the different concepts that have come about, uh, working for the right balance, uh, it's, it's, um, it's not a, a static uh, job. Being in procurement, you have to also evolve. It's part of the, the, the evolution process. And as such, I also evolved. Uh, the, the new tools that came out, uh, well, sustainability has always been something that has been at the core of the concepts of my values and the values of the companies. Um, but then you have the digitalization. A lot of these software and solutions that came afterwards were incorporated into the strategy. We're incorporated. So it's a, you know, take the basics. Uh, you want to have a very lean organization. To have a lean organization, you have to do only the essential and the added value uh, activities. Everything else you digitalize, you automate. Okay, so it's it's an evolutionary process, thinking strategically and adapting to the tools that you have coming out uh, on a regular basis, such as uh, AI digitalization. Um, but always keeping your core values. Sustainability in the companies I have been with has always been a part of our, of our values, our core values. So talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, we, we were talking about the challenges and we we're talking about the savings that, you know, that are possible and, you know, the struggles around that and all of that. Those are two sometimes very opposite things really like people people who want to save and people who want to like curb some of the challenges that come they don't want to go the green sustainable route how do you how do you like what would you give what would be your advice to somebody in the space of procurement to balance those two themes out well th there are opportunities everywhere even when you look at sustainability sometimes our mindset is 
sustainability has to be more expensive. And not everything is that transparent. Uh, if you have a factory and you can have the windows of the factory instead of walls or uh, open ceiling where you can have the sunlight coming in instead of lights, it's a sustainability because you're using less energy. If you can use less energy uh, in the plant, it's beneficial. Uh, on the packaging, um, why do you need packaging? Uh, I think that a lot of times we have to question these things uh, and look for different alternatives. For example, the packaging. If I can use a returnable packaging system on the long run, I can save money. Um, so so there, there is, it, it's never an easy uh, situation, okay? Because when we talk about the raw materials basis, it's still a cost issue uh, that, that you do not have in terms of recycled content uh, activities in, in factories. You do not have yet the volume to leverage uh, and, and to bring forward competitive pricings, but this will take time. But as the customer changes, this will also be balanced out. Uh, if you look at the mobile phones when they came out, huge prices then started going down, down, down. The portable computers, same thing. As these concepts become more introduced more into mass consumption as a change in the customer demand, we will see also a softening uh, of these situations, softening of these costs. But as in everything, you have to find the opportunities where they exist and find the right balance. Got it. Okay, amazing. Thank you for that. So, so how did Portugal impact your work that living elsewhere wouldn't have? I mean, you've been to India, you, you, you know, you've seen the uh, geographies of uh, procurement and textiles and all of that. How did uh, Portugal, you think, impact your, your life and your career? Greatly. It, it gave me a great work-life balance. I live in paradise. So when you live in paradise, um, where you have family, you have uh, good weather, you, you have a, a stable economy, more or less. But you have good weather, you have health, you have a healthy family, you have uh, culture, you have, you know, it, it's, it's a, it created the right work balance that I, that I knew would be there to, to support me in, in the difficult days, because there are difficult days in, in, in any activity. Um, so Portugal does bring that. Uh, if we say it brings a lot of opportunities, we know there's not that much industry here. There's not that much growth uh, in, in terms of industry. So uh, I'm happy to work with the companies that I work with uh, installed here that, that continue looking for, for these opportunities. We have some golden nugget companies, I would say, um, but there are not huge opportunities. It's much different if I go living in Germany and professionally, you would have much more opportunities. Question is, if I would have the right work-life balance that would meet my expectations. And that I'm not sure I would have. Tell me in your, in your younger days, and, and I always like, like to ask questions that would interest other younger listeners also, but in your younger days, did you sometimes think that it would be better to be in a country or in a place where there's more hustle and where there's more competition. Without a doubt, yes. Yeah. Without a doubt, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. That, that's kind of helpful, <laughs> you know. You know, like sometimes people just want to retire at 35 to a quiet island and live their life there. So that's just that's just good. That's a satiating thought. So thank you. Um. Okay. Can you help me with how do you pronounce it? You pronounce it Borstina, right? Borstina. Yes. Borstina. Okay. Why did you move after such a successful long 14 years at Borgstena? You know, you were the vice president there. Uh, why did you decide to move from that to one alliance? If, if that's not a confidential conversation. No, 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 it's, it's no issue. Yeah. Uh, I was 40 some years old, 46 years old at that time, 46, 47. And it comes a, a, life, a time in your life where if you're going to do something different and, and do a different activity, contribute to the world in a different way. It's at that age. Uh, I, it's either there or I, I would be in a very tedious situation for the next 15, 20 years. You know, I could have maintained my situation as was, a very safe and comfortable environment. But in terms of your own professional growth and expectations, there is a time in your life where you want a new challenge. Uh, you, you feel it. And you think this is the one I want. This is the challenge I'm willing to take 
and let me try something different, something that can contribute to the society in a positive way. Okay, and that's it. <laughs> so there, there is no um, very specific reasons. Okay? So it, it just comes a time in your life that uh, if, if you're going to do something different, it's it, you have to define when that is. Uh, because you get a certain age, of course, where it's more difficult to start a new project, to start something new. Um, and I already had the, the age where in my mindset was, okay, now I have to do something. And it's always a, a new challenge to do different things. Yeah, I get that. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's brave to make that jump at you know, at a later stage, but it's interesting. So tell us a little more about your current role. Okay. Uh, what are you doing at Global Source Alliance? And yeah. Sure. Um, when we when I went to this project, I went with a few different colleagues of mine. We started the project from uh, zero. Okay, so it, it was a new company that we started. Uh, we work with two different sectors. We work with, with two different areas. We work in business development, companies that want to go to automotive that we support. Uh, we indicate what is the right products, collections, um, and we take them to the OEMs. We take them to the next level. Okay, and we give them that opportunity to, to present themselves uh, and to develop their businesses in automotive scope. The other part we work is the part where I'm more focused on where we do supply chain management projects and global procurement for different organizations. Uh, currently I'm working within one alliance and, and I would say four different uh, customer and fields, okay, where I work obviously in their procurement as head of procurement in some cases, in other cases as supply chain management, in other cases on a project by project basis. Okay. So I work with different organizations, smaller companies to companies over 1 billion turnover in specific projects. So it gives me the diversity in terms of activities and fields that makes life fun. Interesting. So it's a, it's a big jump. It's a it's a big change from your last role, right? Yes, it's a change from the last role, um, but it's also more challenging. It it brings more challenges on board. You have to learn new things, new industries, new technologies, and that helps you to grow. Also, instead of maintaining just the same level, and it helps you to grow. It helps you to no new business areas, new business segments. So it, it brings more fun into the equation. Got it. Okay. So, so, you know, we spoke about the market and the challenges that the market is faced, uh, faces in the space of sustainability and procurement. Uh, we also spoke about, you know, your jump and your time at Borch Stena um, and, you know, like the, the work-life balance and all of that. But what were some of the biggest personal challenges that you faced um, during your you know 20 plus years in procurement and and what would you account them to well the, the there is one challenge that was very interesting which came in the 2009 uh, crisis which brought something new to, to the playbook which was a lot of companies going out of business so we had to mitigate a lot of situations, uh, procure new suppliers, uh, new solutions, and install uh, a different system in, in terms of uh, mitigation of risks. Okay? Uh, financial mitigation of risks was not something that was very highlighted before, and it started being highlighted in the 2009 crisis. So I would say that was one of the, the big uh, challenges, issues. Uh, the other one I would say would be with COVID. With COVID, we saw something that we never saw before in a crisis where you had uh, variation on the offer and demand at the same time. So th this created a huge complexity, huge complexity. This has really challenged the status quo in a lot of the mindsets. Uh, got it. Uh, what what did you learn through the challenges? I mean, and what what helped you get out of those challenges? You have to analyze. You have to go to the whiteboard, draw everything. You have to draw the flows, draw the options, think lean, 
Uh, the, the lean mindset has been a good tool over these last years. And of course, uh, reading a lot. <laughs> uh, I have to read a lot of new books, a lot of new ideas, a lot of new uh, procurement thoughts that, that, are, that are shared by the different colleagues. Um, so that, that's also something that you need to continue doing. You have to continuously learn what is new, what is available, how others have surpassed the challenge, okay? And because there is no one size fits all solution. So every crisis is different and every company in each crisis has different challenges that need to be uh, seen. Okay, so at that time, the, the, the focus has to be on having the right inventory uh, to satisfy the customers. So you needed to start a dual sourcing strategy to find near shoring uh, possibilities. You needed to look for alternative products that can be replaced on that on that specific uh, manufacturing site. Um, you needed to look at geographical expansions, uh, different uh, geographies, um, different uh, areas of the world that were having different problems at each time. So th there is no one size fits all uh, solution, but uh, but I would say it's it's constantly growing uh, that it's necessary. If, if, you're, if you just stick to the old tools the way you did it in the past, you're going to be in a museum. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, I, think, I think if you just keep constantly innovating, going back, innovating, re, reinventing. Okay. Reinventing ourselves. Uh, it's something that... Ourselves. Yeah, yeah. The other day that, I was talking, yeah, go on, sorry. It's something that I've done in, in the different companies that I'm at. You know, there is... I reinvented functions and reinvent myself considering the company strategy where the company needs to go, wants to go. It's part of the growing. Yeah. I'm not the I, same person I was four years ago. Yeah, I know. I, I fully hear you. I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I run a think tank for kids on the spectrum of autism um, for 60, 70% of my time. And I've been in this field for the last 15 years. I've, I kind of like propel them into giftedness. But just the growth sometimes gives you anxiety, but if you stop growing, then that gives you anxiety too. So just finding the balance on the pendulum is hard, but it's so necessary and so important. Um, right. and, and I think that's where sometimes companies and sustainability and you know the vegan food revolution and green washing things goes wrong because we, right. we, we move the pendulum too much to that side instead of finding a middle ground. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a I long agree. conversation because it's yeah. you know everybody you hear a lot of these vegan concepts even though on wanting to end all the the leather industry, um, but at yeah. the end you know do we stop eating cow meat? Do yeah. we stop eating milk? Yeah. You know, what are you going to do? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, there has to be a right balance in everything. I fully hear you. It's yeah. It's it's how we compartmentalize and make people one different from another. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, um, so, so moving forward, you know, you, you seem to be s such a lib open-minded liberalist in your ideas of reinventing innovation, strategic change, uh, facing challenges head on. How is it being the vice president of such a big organization? Because I reckon the people you were managing and the people who were around you probably didn't always align with your principles and your way of work. How did that, how did that work? No, it's, it's like you said, not everybody aligns with our reasoning and thinking, um, be it in that function or the other functions. What I normally do is I explain to people what I want to do and why. I get their input, I analyze their input. Uh, I see if, it, if it's um, something that I can incorporate in my own strategy. So there's always a catch ball here um, in, in terms of strategy. I have my vision, my ideas, there's some catch ball. Okay, we exchange ideas, see if there's, this is the way to go or not, which is uh, one of the lean concepts in Hashim Kandri uh, when defining the, the, the strategy and, and the metrics and the goals and objectives. So th this was always something that there was communication. There is communication. Um, and at the end of the day, if they don't align, then I take the decision that it's my decision it's to go that way. And in parallel to that, I talk to everyone the same way, uh, be it someone from the shop floor, 
you get from high management. Uh, I am like this with everyone. So th there is no uh, different way of treating people. So I treat everyone equally. I treat everyone the best way. I treat everyone like I would like them to treat my kids. So with respect, when you do this with respect, uh, when you treat everyone well, then it, of course, there's always a situation where they don't agree with your final decision, but that's life. I, I love that. I, I love that, that how do we respect individual differences, state our point, and then let the other person decide what part do they want to agree with, how much not, how much to align, how much not. Yeah, respect because is I, I, important. At the end of the day, when it's management, you have to take decisions, uh, be it at whatever management level. You're there because you have to take decisions. If not, you weren't yeah. there. Yeah. And, and of course, you, you try to, to get everybody involved, uh, empower people in the decision making, uh, work catch ball where you give them uh, yeah. some ideas and you give them feedback back to you. But at the end of the day, you're the manager. You have to take that final decision. And it's not easy, but someone has to take it. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that because I think it's such a such an integral part of management. And I think sometimes people don't spell it out as clearly as you just did. So, so thank you for that. So, so let's like, let's get to, is there anything else that you want to talk about being the vice president of such a big organization? Because I, I've been a part of some really big organizations and I've seen leaders a lot more stressed out about their positions than you seem. So is there anything else you'd want to share with us about? Uh, I think uh, titles uh, to me have never been important. Um, yeah. Titles don't make you, what makes you is what what you are as a leader. I've known many organizations that the leader was someone from the shop floor, in some cases was middle management that we would look to as for leadership. What I tried to do is by looking at this and having this mindset, be it whatever title I have on the name, I'm still Rui, this is me. Yeah. Okay? And I'm here to work as part of a team, not as just a boss. So yeah. for me, the titles don't, uh, they are what they are. Yeah, I love that. Okay, awesome. Um, so, so let's go back a little to, to the complicated side of procurement. Um, what, what are some challenges, Rui, that you expect we will see in the space of textiles, but even otherwise, what, what are some challenges that you foresee okay. in the, procurement? The, the challenges that, 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 that I foresee, and at the same time, what I think the focus will, will be in, in the next uh, coming year, I think that the cash to cash cycle and profitability will be at the core uh, of the decisions of the companies. Uh, what we're going to have is high inflation rates. It's going to continue uh, because when we look at it, even if it goes to six, seven percent next year uh, in Europe, for example, it, it's six, seven percent over 10 percent this year, over five percent the year before. So when you start adding it up, the percentages have a huge impact. So the inflation rates is, is a challenge. OK, because this also in terms of procurement, you, you will have situations where your suppliers will come to you for cost increases because of the inflation and the costs that, that led to it. You're, we're going to continue seeing some instability in terms of exchange rates. Uh, we've seen the Euro dollar being already at a, at a different level uh, a few months ago. Now it's at $106 per euro or something close to that. A few weeks ago was 0 0.95. Um, so in, in Europe in itself, and I think this in, in a global, we're going to continue to see some instability of raw materials. I continued seeing that in terms of energy due to the war, especially the war, but not only the war, the, the costs of energy will continue to increase. And as we want to go more green, as you said, um, and here is also some greenwashing, I would say, as we want to go more green, this will bring more costs, okay? As you develop new technologies, be it uh, solar energy, be it hydro, um, as you're developing these new uh, technologies, it's normal that the, the, the energy uh, will continue to increase prices. There is a, There will come a time where we need to focus on the availability of raw materials. That's why I'm very keen on design to design, design from the beginning, the, the product that will launch the market until the end of life cycle and see if I can re-enter in the life cycle. 
um, at the way that the world is going in the consumption of raw materials, I think that there are a lot of instances that in, in 10, 15 years, if we don't do anything dramatic, it will start affecting the businesses, not only the, the, the commodity prices in terms of transformation, but also availability of certain raw materials will be in question. Uh, when we look at the, the geopolitical factors, it's still very unstable. If anyone says it, that, that the, the crystal ball says it's gonna be okay, uh, I don't have that crystal ball yet. Uh, and I don't think anyone has it. Um, as we are in, in an inflationary uh, basis, what will happen here uh, is an increase on the interest rates. As, as you've seen the Fed in the United States and in Europe also increase the, the interest rates. This is something that we were not used to it in Europe or the US. Okay, and it's already over 4% in the US and in Europe, approximately 4% also. So we're, we're seeing here an increase of interest rates, um, an increase in inflation. So this is a perfect storm where later we will see a decrease in, in consumption and demand. Okay, and so here what we do produce, we have to make sure we have money that uh, we make money with it. Um, and as you have the interest rate going up, so money is more expensive uh, and you have the inflation going up. So the articles are more expensive. Companies will focus a lot on cash to cash, uh, cash to cash conversion. And here procurement can support by working with suppliers in consignment stocks and, and near shoring suppliers. Near shoring, you might not have a cost benefit per se, but you can have um, a cash flow balance where you don't need to, to buy the goods one, two months earlier. So uh, I do think that these are the major um, challenges amongst the others that we know, uh, global warming, uh, pandemics, okay? They're nothing new. Um, global warming has been talked about for a long time and we're seeing the effects globally uh, all over the world. We're seeing situations, um, I remember two years ago in Texas, um, due to some storms and some nasty weather, uh, we had a, a difficult situation with the plastics industry okay, where the prices skyrocketed because of the problems that were in the factories in Texas because of global warming. Um, so these, these blue, these, these effects, uh, blue swan events um, that now even some people are calling a gray rhinos because they're, they're obvious, probable, high impact um, and, and you know they're going to exist you know global warming is no longer uh, in, and I think global warming nor COVID pandemic are blue swan events black swan events but are gray rhinos uh, instead of black swan events so th these are the challenges that I foresee in a macro level and um, be it wherever you are in the world and at the Can same I time can I ask you two questions right here uh, as we, you know, as you take this forward, can you also expand a little bit upon, so I'm, I'm personally also really curious about these subjects. What do you think is causing the high, the sudden shoot up in inflation rates? We're even seeing that with the Indian rupee, it's been the lowest that it's been in a long time. Um, what do you think is the cause for these sudden high inflation rates, high interest rates, and what are the other fact, unobvious factors that contribute to global warming? So as well, you as you grow forth, forth, forth well, yeah. normally inflation uh, can either be cost push or demand pull. Um, it, it can be based on cost. Okay, so you have the energy going up because of the war that pushes cost on forward. So that's cost provoking uh, inflation. But before the war, we already had uh, inflation, which is more associated with the global demand that was higher than the existing capabilities. So what happens here in this demand pull situation is the world stopped for a while, okay? With the pandemic, it stopped. And the governments, the, the way that they went around to, to support this was Printing money, putting money in the economy. So people have money, companies have money, governments have money, so they spend money. So th this increases the demand. There's not enough supply. So you have here an imbalanced situation. The pandemic stopped the world. It stopped it. 
we can say in you know, different words, but uh, I'd rather be direct to the point. Okay, and, and this created something on a global level never seen before. Uh, people stopped, stopped buying, everybody was at home, started changing the, the, the consumptions. They started buying via Amazon, via the different routes, um, but still some consumption. Then the governments went out in Europe, in the United States, I'm not sure what happened in India, but here in these governments, they went and gave money. They gave money to keep the, 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 the people living. Uh, so when the, the, you inject all of this money in the, the economies, you know, you heat up the economies. It's just a very simple economic uh, factor. You put money in, you print money, you increase demand, there's not enough supply. So for the supply to balance it out, it increases prices. Container price from uh, China to, to Europe or from Asia to Europe, you know, they're traditionally around 2000 US dollars. Last year, people were paying 16, 20,000. And because there was a demand and the supply was limited. Now it's back to three, 4,000. But th this is what happens when you have this imbalance. So you have a demand pull situation where the, the global economies were placed with a lot of printed money that, that created a huge demand, not enough offer, and then the price curve goes up. After that, you have the cost push situation where the energy prices started going up. And that obviously has a, a domino effect until the end consumer. Yeah, got it, got it. And, and it's, what, what are the other factors that you think are contributing to global warming? I think you know, the, the I, fact... I, I think, and, and also, uh, yeah, so, so let, let's talk about global warming and the impact that's having on different industries. Well, global warming is, is bringing a lot of instability uh, because we have no idea what's going to happen uh, with the water going up, um, what will happen in, in terms of the, the seas. There is uncertainty of, of the results. Okay? The, the causes are clear. Uh, we as an industrialized world did much harm to the planet in the last, last 50 years, okay? By producing, by burning, by doing what we did in terms of industries in a global level, by the CO2 emissions that we emitted globally, the world is responsible for what we have today. And so global warming is an effect of the way that we treated the world the last 50 years. So I'm, I'm curious, Rui, you know, I sometimes personally feel global warming is, has to do with the rising sea levels, but I think also it's the amount of information that's increasing in our world. Just like, just the, the amount of everything that's just going on increasing. So, so it feels like everything is now the sea around us and that's mm -hmm. rising buildings, industries, variety of things, information, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, you know, there's just like a constant overload. And, and I wonder, and, and I know that I've, we've spoken to a lot of people in tic, tic, like SaaS uh, people who are in procurement, IT people who are in procurement, tech people who are in procurement, but nobody's spoken about, do you think all like, where is all of this going to go and is it going to crash somewhere or what what's going to be the future of all of this i think that the next five to ten years will dictate what the future will be either we start thinking differently okay as a society and make change because if we don't it's it's going to continue and even escalate even more and the rising sea level is in effect uh, is what happens with global warming where you have the North Pole and the ice turning water, increasing the sea levels all around. You have this instabilities and it's going to continue unless we do something very different. And I think that we as a society are still a high consumption society um, and we haven't made that change yet, the fundamental change. Yeah. There has to be a, a real commitment globally um, we see some commitment from some countries, some places, but I don't see a global commitment yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm always very conscious of how much information are we putting out in the world and how much of it is necessary, how much of it is 
adding levity and you know even with production of any anything just how much does this world need um yeah no, okay. i don't think the world needs as much as it has today in terms yeah, of no, that. No, no, for sure for sure for sure yeah oh, india <laughs> is to blame for a lot of it okay Moving we all are. Forward. Yeah, moving forward. So, Ruipi, if you had to start your career all over again, go back 24 years, what would be some pivotal changes that you feel you would have made that would have maybe like like changed the trajectory of how your life went? And, and maybe you wouldn't change anything, but what are your thoughts on that? I think uh, everything happens for a reason. Um, if I could go back... I think I would read more when I was younger and uh, start developing myself more strategically when I was younger. I think that when we're young, we're more operational, we're more uh, heads-on uh, looking on short-term and less on medium-long-term. So what I, I would change if, you know, we can, also, we can all say that everything's perfect, we wouldn't change anything, but I'd like to be very clear on this and transparent. I would think more strategically in the long term at a younger age. And and if you had to define strategically, you would you say reading more is what you would say is strategic or be more exposed to what is out there? Be more exposed to what's out there, read more, uh, learn more, uh, and question more. Um, you know, if you have a, a function, start thinking not only of my operational duties today, but in terms of an organization, where the organization wants to be in five, 10 years time, and how can I help it to achieve that success at that time or even earlier? How can I contribute? That, that's what I, I'm, I'm speaking about strategic thinking. And, and I believe this can be done at different levels in the organization, at all levels this can be done. Um, and this is what I would do differently at a younger age. Start thinking in the organizations where I'm at, is the, we are here today five, 10 years where we're going to be, what can I contribute in a different way uh, to, to be there either faster or more successful? Okay, what can I do different in my function? What can the company do different in different functions to be more involved at a global level within the organizations? And think differently. Uh, and for that, of course, you need to have open mind, you need to, to read more and see what's going on on, on similar organizations and best in class uh, organizations. That I would do differently. Yeah, I love that. That's such great advice. That's that's amazing. Thank you. Um, so so just like kind of catching up from this, if you know somebody is listening to this and they're got wanting to you know kind of chart their life like you have, or you know even better in a different way, um, considering where we are today in twenty twenty two, where you know. I'm sure even 20 years ago, there was such a crisis of some sort, except maybe we didn't notice it then. But like right now where we are with all these challenges, with sea levels rising in every sense, what would be your advice to someone getting into procurement, starting their journey right now? I think the words were from Winston Churchill when he said, never let a good crisis go to waste. I love that. If you're in this journey now, there are opportunities out there, okay? Yeah. Just think of how you can contribute. If you're just gonna be plus one, then it's it's not gonna do it, okay? It's just one, little, but if you look at it in a very pragmatic way, then this is the organization I'm going into. This is where the organization wants to be here in five, 10 years. What can I contribute? What are the captivating opportunities? What is the added value I can bring? You know, yeah. look at it that way because the, in crisis, there are always opportunities. Yeah. You know, there is an old saying, when someone is crying, another person is selling the tissue so they can clean the tears. Totally. Yeah. That's so never let a good crisis go to waste. That's what yeah. I would say. Yeah. And, and fortunately, it's, it's a crisis and they're cyclical. They will continue. Yeah. Yeah. This will get better for a while. There's another crisis there. Yeah. It's cyclical. I've been in the in working over 25 years and there's always a crisis. And I think that's what makes a person strong when you learn to make the most of a crisis uh, emotionally and intellectually. Um, yeah, thank you. That's, it that's really <laughs> Yeah, perhaps. Um, anything else that you feel like we should have spoken about today, Rui, that we didn't well, it's, um Well, the idea was really sharing with the people that in, even in this complex environment, uh, the, the, 
and you know, as procurement professionals, we're all receiving letters of our suppliers increasing prices, um, the force major, a lot of difficult situations. All, all I want to transmit is that even with this complexity, there's always opportunities. Uh, mission uh, savings are always possible. Uh, we have to think in a different way. We have to use uh, go digital uh, in the organizations in order that we can streamline our own costs. Um, in short term, we have to work always with um, cost indicators, uh, cost breakdowns, where you analyze the cost that you're receiving, if it makes sense or not, because the supplier will go to you when it increases, but they won't go to you when the price decreases. Yeah. Okay, so keep, keep up these indicators, uh, work the cost breakdown. And I, I highly incentivate that the companies create a cost cutting team within the organization. In, in order that you look at a product, if I need all these functions of the product, if I need all these parts. And there are tools out there. Um, and these are some of the ones that I use in this, this world. Um, and also the game theory that uh, they're all small windows of opportunity and take them when they appear. And the yeah. savings exist, but you have to go after them. They won't come to you. You have to go to them. Yeah, for sure. See, that's such an important thing that you just said. Savings exist, but you have to go towards them. They're not going to come towards you, for sure. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, think, I think that kind of sums up everything that we've spoken about beautifully. <laughs>